Hey, welcome back to another video about design patterns. Today, we're going to explore three behavioral design patterns that will definitely improve your code design skills. If you want to check out other types of design patterns, you can use the links in the description below. As I mentioned in the previous video about creational design patterns, there are three types of design patterns according to the Gang of Four book. Today, we're going to focus on behavioral design patterns which essentially are just some co-design blueprints for the interaction between different components. To express that in a more visual way, if you got a class that is either receiving requests or is getting some data from an external component, and you want to propagate that request or any event derived from it to other classes, then you may want to design your code so that you can easily add new receivers while keeping the components decoupled for better accessibility. In a nutshell, that's the role of behavior design patterns. The first pattern we're going to talk about is called Observer, and the reason you should know how it works is because it's related to other critical concepts that we see in the industry, like Publisher-Subscriber pattern, UI frameworks, message queues, or even reactive programming that we're going to talk about in a future video. Now the use case for which Observer pattern has been created is the following. Let's suppose you got a class, let's call it Subject, that contains an internal state which may change over time. We should see that internal state just as a bunch of private fields with some setter methods to be able to change them from the outside of the class. Now, whenever that state changes, you want other classes, let's call them observers, to be notified so that they can update their internal state or take any other action they want based on that event. There are two flavors or interaction models of the observer pattern that you need to choose from according to your specific use case. The first flavor is push-based, which means that whenever the subject gets an update, it will push that update to all the observers that are interested in its updates. This means that the subject controls what it sends to the observers. The second flavor is pull-based, where the observers are pulling the updates from the subject when they are notified that a change has happened. In this case, the observers control what data they get from the subject. Some of them may not be interested in the update at all, and some of them may do something about it. Both flavors have pros and cons, so you need to decide which flavor maximizes the vectors you need for your specific use case. Now let's take an example to see how the observer pattern works. Let's assume you have a class that is called database, which only stores a string field. Whenever we change the value for that field, we want to store the update on the local disk, send an email and a Slack notification with it. In this example, we're going to create both pull and push based models, and we'll start with the push based one. The first thing we need to do is to define the abstractions we need for the observer pattern, which are just two of them, the observer and the subject. For the observer, we can just create an interface with an update method that takes a string as a parameter, because that's the actual update that we're interested in. For the subject, we can create a base class that should provide the following functionalities. It should store the observers in an internal field, in a list in that case. It should provide an API to attach or detach observers dynamically. In other related contexts, those methods may be called subscribe and unsubscribe, add or remove, link and unlink. They're essentially the exact same thing as you'll see in this pattern. And very important, you should provide a method that sends the notification to all the observers that are registered. This base class can be subclassed to implement specific logic, in our case, to just manage that string field. Very important is to not forget to call the method in the base class that updates all the observers. Notice that from the subject, we're pushing the data that has just been updated to all the observers. That's the idea of the push-based interaction model. The client will just create a subject and all the observers it needs, attach the observers to the subject, and start changing the state of the subject to see the updates flowing around. Notice that we can dynamically add or remove the observers by just using the attach or detach methods, which is something that really improves the extensibility of the code. For the pool-based interaction model, we need to do some minor changes to the code. First, the observer abstraction needs to be converted to an abstract class instead of an interface, because we need to store the subject inside it to be able to pull the updated state out of it. The update method doesn't need a state parameter anymore because now it acts just like a notification. 
when it gets cold, this is just a signal which marks that the subject state has been changed. The observer can ignore that, or it can pull the state and do something with it. This decision belongs only to the observer. The subject abstraction is to store the data payload because it needs to be accessible from the observers, and of course, those ones need to be updated accordingly. In a real scenario, you may also want to abstract the state as well to improve the flexibility of the code even more. So that's pretty much all about the observer pattern. Let me know in the comments below what you think about it. Now we're gonna move to another behavioral pattern that has a slightly different approach. This one is called chain of responsibility and I've seen it so many times in legacy code bases. The idea of that pattern is the following. You got a class, let's call it client for example, that is receiving requests from another component. Each request needs to be processed. So to do that, the client passes the request to a processing pipeline which contains multiple classes that are chained together and each one of them is capable of processing that request. As you can see, the idea is simple. You get a request and then you pass it to that chain of classes in order to be processed. The way it works is that the client has a reference to the head of the chain and once it receives a request, it gets dispatched to the first processing object and this one should decide whether it is able to process the request or not. If it is, then the request will get processed. If it's not, it should pass the request to the next processing object until there is one able to process it. Now of course, for this design to work, we need to make sure that for each request there should be at least one object in the chain that is able to process it. Otherwise, the request will just pass along the chain and it will not get processed at all. This is the only enforcement that we need to consider. Now depending on your specific use case, you may want to order the processing components of the chain so that you minimize the number of components that each request needs to pass through until it reaches the component that is able to process it. Now let's take a look on a conceptual sample code for that design pattern. First, let's create an interface for the actual request that we're going to process. We can just assume that it has a string content. Now the handlers should also have an abstraction, which may look like that. We got a method that takes the request and processes it, and also one that tells whether the handler is able to process the request or not. Of course, we need to create specific handlers which implement that interface, as we see in this example. Now, to create a chain of handlers, we have two options. We can either have each handler know which is the next handler in the chain, basically emulating a singly linked list, or we can have a class on top of the collection of handlers that manages the execution of the request through the chain. I personally believe that last option would be a better one to implement that pattern, and we'll see why in a second, but first, let's see how that kind of class would look like. We can store the chain in any collection that preserves the insertion order of the elements, in that case an array list, and when we want to execute the request, we can just traverse the list and use the first handler that is able to process the request. Simple and straightforward. The client will just create a processing chain with all the handler it needs and will just call execute to send the request. Now the reason I like this option compared to the other one is because it's easier to order the handlers in the chain, which is something that you may need in most cases. What do you think about that design pattern? Have you ever used it? Let me know in the comments below. The last behavioral design pattern we're gonna talk about is called strategy. And the whole idea around it is to hide different types of processing units under the same abstraction to be able to ship between them easily at runtime. In the Gang of Four, those processing units are called algorithms or strategies, but they can be any type of logic that is likely to change over time and they don't have side effects, so they are quite self-contained. The architecture of that pattern is pretty straightforward. We got a strategy abstraction which should usually provide a single method to execute the chosen strategy and based upon that we should have concrete strategies that implement their own processing logic. We should also have a place where we specify the selected strategy and use it to execute the logic. We can call this class strategy context for example. The client will simply select the specific strategy it needs and will talk to the strategy context to execute it. As you can see, the client code and the concrete strategies are completely decoupled, so they can be developed independently without affecting each other. That's the biggest advantage of that design pattern. 
Let's take a look on an example to see how this works. Let's say we have an array and we want to sort it using multiple algorithms. The strategy abstraction will only have a sort method that takes the array and returns the same array but with the elements in a sorted order. The concrete strategies will implement specific sorting algorithms like quicksort and merge sort, and the strategy context will store the strategy that is chosen by the client. Notice that the context is working with the abstraction and not with the specific strategies, and will also provide a method to execute a sort with the chosen strategy. The client will just create a context with a selected strategy and will launch the sort method. As you can see, the client is able to change the strategy at runtime, which is something really useful. As a rule of thumb, you should use that pattern when you got a bunch of similar logical units that are doing the same thing but in a different way, so that you can abstract them under the common interface. And with that, thank you so much for watching, I really hope you found that video useful, and don't forget to subscribe because more incredible content is on the way.